Sorry. Recording in progress. Welcome everybody to the House Six podcast, our movie podcast about movies. This week we are continuing our journey through the Academy Awards Best Picture with All Quiet on the Western Front from 1930. Um before we get into that, we will meet the cast by asking them a simple question. How would you describe this movie in three words or less? So I'll go first, just to give you guys some time to think. I thought this movie was brutal, but honest. Okay, who wants to go next? Mm. I'll go next. Jerry, go ahead. Not that quiet. <laughs> Not that quiet. That's a good one. Michael, would you like to go next? No, Jared Thomas, go <laughs> <laughs> me? Yeah, go um, Thomas. Sad, why, cat, why? Oh, cat. For a second, I had to figure out who cat K- was. K- 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 <laughs> yeah, not, not C A T. K A T. Okay, mm. Michael, you got one for us? I'm struggling so much with this one. Because I have like I feel like this movie is in so many different segments for me. Um real, yes. We'll throw that one in there. Theatrical. I'm gonna throw that in there, and then long. I like your boots. I like your boots. Yeah, <laughs> I like your boots. <laughs> you like the boots. All about boots. <laughs> All right. So before we get into the movie, a little or into the movie, a little background at about the awards. The third Academy Awards were held in November fifth, nineteen thirty, at the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, the films in competition were released from August 1929 through July 1930. Held only seven months after the second awards, 1930 remains the only year that two Academy Awards were held. All Quiet was the first um, film to win bo- Best Director and Best Picture. Best Sound Recording was the first new category since the awards were introduced. A portion of the show was filmed for the first time. The Love Parade had the most nominations with six. Top winners were All Quiet on the Western Front in the Big House with two awards each. All right, so then we get into the movie. A um, little trivia before that. All Quiet on the Western Front was from Universal, debuted in Los Angeles in April 21st, 1930. Based um, on the best-selling novel from 1929, uh, the film was directed by Louis Millstone, who had previously won a Best Director for Two Arabian Nights, that in Best Comedy Picture, which is not around anymore. Um, yeah, it should be, though. <laughs> it stars Academy Award nominee Lou Ayers, Louis uh, Wilhelm, John Ray, Arnold Lucy, and Ben Alexander. The film was shown uh, with two, or the film was shot with two cameras side by side. Uh, one was a sound film, and the other was a trans. Uh, the other was with translated title cards for the international audience. Two thousand extras were hired for the film, many coming from the German veteran community of Los Angeles. The film was released to great success, receiving a sequel in 1936. Uh, The film was banned in Nazi Germany. It was also banned in Italy, in uh, Austria, France, and one of the Australian states for pacifism. So that is the background to the movie we are watching. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, So this movie... Let's start with the char- our lead character, whose name is Paul. Um, what did you guys think of Paul? I think I'll let you guys talk um, since I've talked a lot. So uh, just go over, yeah, the character so first. I'll go first. Uh, Paul has been the first main character out of these movies we watched that is bearable and pretty likable. Um, he never, he wasn't, like, the last two movies, annoying as heck, the main characters, like, really the whole cast was <laughs> both just annoying, but this one, Paul was pretty cool. I especially, like, like he gives a speech, or, like, like a monologue type of thing in a classroom later on, um, that was really good. 
but I liked him a lot. Yeah, I like that kind of full circle moment where he goes back to the beginning of it. It's like all like kind of glorifying war and being a soldier and hey, go fight and get this honor and everything like that. And then at the end, he's like, no, it's just massacre of humans. Like, that's what I feel like most of the story is about is just especially the point where he comes up with that enemy soldier, whatever. He's like, we could have been friends, you know, like if we didn't, you weren't wearing that uniform and I wasn't wearing this one or whatever. And so, yeah, that I feel like there's a lot of growth with this character, which surprised me because I felt like the first bit of this movie was kind of slow and didn't really focus on any characters. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. And then it picks up a lot with actually following him and kind of seeing him go back and come like go back and forth between the two. And yeah, so I, I enjoyed his his growth over the movie. Thomas? Um, I'm not a huge fan of this actor. Uh, I I think he I think it's one of those things about the the transition from silent silent pictures to talk talkies and they hadn't quite bridged that that gap yet now i like paul as a character uh like from the book and everything else like that uh i think he's a really really well written character um there's also a kind of audio uh, audio autobiographical character from the author uh, is remark i think is his name um so basically what he experienced or what paul experienced is what the author experienced during world war uh, one um and yeah i do like that scene where he goes back to me that's like the the worst part of the movie not, not the worst part the worst feeling part of that movie uh, is where he has to go back to germany and like talk to people and the uh he has a, a brand new perspective on on all of this and yet everybody else is back in the homeland has the exact same perspective and it just you can see like now granted like, i think the 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 classroom scene is probably his best acting in the movie uh but you can see just how it drains him how like nobody has changed but he's changed and uh, this is a great character cool okay before we go on i just want to mention that hell six now has its own youtube channel so follow us and subscribe at uh hell six on youtube um also follow us our main channel that's good stuff on youtube and then uh thomas could you get us give us the instagram uh, handle again for that's good stuff is yeah. that's good stuff productions on Instagram, uh, all one word, and then for the uh, for the email is how six movie podcast uh, at gmail dot com, and six is the letter or the the number six. Sorry about that. So those are those. All right, this uh, let's get into the plot a little. This movie had a lot of similarities with our first uh, movie, which was Wings, I thought. Um, and it starts off in, like Jared said, in a classroom where we're getting all this raw, raw. Um, there's like a parade going on through the streets. And we actually meet one of the characters is the mailman, um, who turns out to be like their drill sergeant in camp. Himmelstadt. Uh, so he gets right? introduced real fast. Like Michael said, it doesn't really focus on one character during the first like third of the movie because uh, we see that we do see Paul in this classroom, but we see a lot of other um, characters that are like one of them's like real scared. He doesn't want to go to war, but the other guys kind of push him into it and be like, yeah, let's go to war because this sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and their teacher kind of gives this impassioned speech about protecting the motherland and stuff like that um so then we head to boot camp um they get they see the mailman and they're like hey it's the mailman and he's like no i'm the drill instructor you guys gotta listen to me um and they don't like him because he's like this little guy um that's always yelling at them and it makes them seem like they march so they kind of they pull a prank on him and they tie him up and spank him and then throw him in some mud. Um, so it's all fun and games until they get, uh, they go to, they actually go to the front. Um, and the first thing we find out is everyone is starving. Um, they haven't even fought yet and they're all hungry. And they ask kind of the older guys, hey, where's the food? And they're like, oh, there's no food. Uh, you got to wait for this. I get, he's a captain, but he kind of reminds me of a sergeant. Um, and that's the cats guy that Thomas was talking about. Uh, he goes out and grabs a pig. Um, these guys are loading pigs on a truck and he steals one and they kind of eat that. It's raining. It's raining a lot. Um, and then can we pause real fast and talk about 
when they first get to boot or not for, when they get to boot camp and um they're changing and not one human knows how to change out of clothes. <laughs> There's like <laughs> so a guy like on his on the yeah. bed doing it. It's like uh why? <laughs> it was the weirdest scene. I was like, did none of them change their clothes before this? Hey, wasn't it <laughs> like the uh, the second bunk of a bunk bed too? Yeah. yeah. And he's just like trying to put pants on. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Maybe he's like, I'm not coming down. I'm, I'm up here. I'm gonna put my pants on. <laughs> Uh, yeah so after the scene where we introduce to the captain who gets some food uh we get the scene where they set up the trenches with the barbed wire um and it's dark and there's like explosions and they're getting down whenever they when whenever the bombs hit really close um it doesn't look like a fun job because one of the guy's hands is like all bloody from the barbed wire go like going through his hands and stuff like that uh, one guy has a massive mallet yeah it true. Like... it's a big old mallet <laughs> uh, so then we get to the dugout uh, the bunker where these guys kind of live and it's terrible in there because they can't sleep because all the bombing going on it's kind of driving the nuts one guy is like crying continuously screaming <laughs> yeah <laughs> the captain has to like beat them up just to make them stop screaming uh, so we get that brutality of war. And then the first battle happens. Uh where pretty much they're in the trenches, and I guess it's the French army that's attacking. Um I think mm-hmm. so. It is. Yeah. So yeah, the French are charging and they're mowing them down with like machine guns and their rifles. There's one graphic scene where, like, did you guys see the scene where the guy's, like, hands, like, tear off and they're just, like, hanging on the barbed yeah, wire? Got, so, like, the guy's, like, going up to the barbed wire and he grabs it and then he gets hit by a mortar shell. And basically the whole thing goes up and then the smoke clears and all it is is his hands, like, yeah. holding there. And apparently that was a real story. So... Yeah. So in many ways, this isn't as brutal as Wings, because like Wings had like you could see them get shot and stuff. And this one, you didn't really see people get shot; they just kind of fell down. Um, but then that scene was like kind of brutal. It was like, wow, look at his hands. <laughs> um, so we get to the first battle; they charge, and then they charge, and it's um, it's a whole thing. <laughs> a whole thing. It's a whole thing. <laughs> um, so uh, stop me if I miss anything or you guys want to talk about something because I'm just going through this thing fast. After the battle, they go get food. Um, turns out, how many did they say left? Like 85? 80. 80 yeah, of like 150 left. or something like that. Out of 160, there is now 60. 80. Okay. So they have double rations, but the guy like doesn't want to give them the double rations. He just wants to feed 80. He's like mad. Um, but then when the higher ups comes, it's like, just feed the guys. Give me a plate. <laughs> Um, I like this the part where he's like, I want more beans, and he's like, Well, there's more beans over there. He's like, I'm too fat. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been one gassy camp because they're yeah. eating a lot of beans. <laughs> um, and then they go visit a friend, um, who was wounded in the battle, and he actually had to have his leg amputated. Um, so he's not happy at all because, um, uh, he just has a pretty upsetting scene when he's like, am I going to make it through it? And he's like, yeah, of course. And then he like goes to talk to the doctor and he's like, I already treated him. There's not much I can do for the poor guy. And he's just, just got to comfort this, this guy. And even he's like, yeah, I'm not going to make it. But it was a pretty well, he, like sad scene. Well, even they're like, that, you know, that guy with the amputee, like he needs our help. He's like, I've done like 12 amputees, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. what He's like, you go about. do it. Got to be specific. Um, So it then it focuses on the guy's boots because they're really nice. Um, They're like handed down. (laughs) One guy's like, now I can win the war because I got these (laughs) nice boots. Mueller Mm -hmm. really wanted those boots. (laughs) Yep, and he they he does get the boots, and we follow the boots for a while as they're going to the next battlefield, and then the boots stop. Um, Because. Like right away, they get to the trench and the guy gets shot. And so that's the end of the boot scenes. Um, no more boots. 
next we get uh introduced to the mailman again he's there um and they're like hey it's our old trainer guy and they he tries to lay down the law again but they're like not having it um paul mm-hmm. paul's like yeah you're we'll beat the crap out of you don't tell us anything uh, you don't give orders here um so the second battle starts uh and the uh the trainer guy's out there with them and he turns out to be a big old coward. He's like too scared to run with them um as they're charging and like Paul beats the crap out of them. But then this other guy comes and says, Hey, we gotta charge, and then he's fine. He's like, Oh, okay, I'll charge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that seems a little weird for me, but um the second battle is very chaotic. Um Paul kind of gets left behind so like the charging army comes and like overtakes him so he's stuck behind enemy lines uh and he's just like trying to hide he finds this hole and then so he's hiding in this hole and then one of the enemy fighters comes and he stabs him so now he's in this hole with this dying guy and he's kind of just like freaking out and the dying guy is just like he tries to like give him water and he's like You'll be okay. We'll, we'll both be okay. But the guy dies pretty fast. And then Paul's left with the dead guy. And he's like kind of just regretting all his choices. And it's like, um, f- please forgive me for killing you. Because he's never killed a guy. I guess never killed a guy up close before. Um, so it really affects him. Uh, so after that, Paul somehow makes it out of that. Um, at night, the fighting dies down, and he just kind of goes back to his camp. Uh, and they, they, I guess they took the town because they have this big party at the beer hall. Um, and so they're all drunk and stuff. Cat gets drunk. And then uh, Paul and some guys, they go for a swim. Well, they're bathing. They're, they're going to take a bath because they haven't taken a bath in, like, forever. <laughs> and then they see some french chicks and they're like yeah (laughs) (laughs) so they're like they're trying to get these girls attention with food and stuff and the girls are like yeah you can just come over here but they can't because they can't go into france because they're like on the border and um so they have to sneak over there and they have some time with the french ladies um and then it's time to get on the march again, which they do, and then Paul is wounded when they're marching. He gets like hit in the side, um, so he's taken to a, a hospital that's run by some Catholic nuns. And he meets this guy that's kind of crazy, um, but really happy. Um, they take Paul away to, I guess, have surgery, and he gets like all frightened because he thinks dying room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he thinks they've taken him to the dying room. Uh, one of Paul's friends is actually there with him, uh, and he had his leg amputated, and he doesn't take it well. Uh, Paul comes back, and he's like, hey, it's going to be all right. <laughs> so Paul gets to leave the hospital, and then he gets to return home. Um, they send him home, and like Jared said, he goes to, back to his old uh, classroom and lay, just lays down some knowledge to the young kids who were looking forward to war and he's like no this is this isn't fun at all uh he meets his parents um he smooches his mom uh, <laughs> you gotta have smoochie with your mom in the old in these old movies every yeah. time uh he goes to have a drink with some old guys and they think they know everything about the war and he's just kind of like no you guys don't know anything i don't know why you guys are telling me this so he's kind of disillusioned. He's like, just send me back. I, there's no point to being here. Um, so he actually goes home early. Um, and there he meets he uh, meets an old friend, one of his group that he used to hang out with. And the guy kind of tells him what happens to everyone. And most of them are dead. Um, Katz is still alive. So he goes and visits him. He's out there, of course, trying to find a pig or something out in the field. So he goes out and visits him. Uh, they get attacked by an airplane that's flying overhead. Uh, Cat is hit first in the ankle um, by some shrapnel. So he's carrying him back, and he doesn't even realize that Cat uh, gets hit again um, and this time dies. So he's carrying a dead man back to camp. Um, so he's 
pretty much alone now. Um, and he realizes that because uh, before he told Cat like that he was his, he's the only guy he had left. Um, so he's alone, but he's kind of like accepted it. Um, so in the final scene, we see Paul. He's in one of the trenches, and he's just like he's not into war at all anymore. Um, he sees a butterfly on the ground. And he's like, oh, that's pretty. So he goes to reach for the butterfly and he's taken out by a sniper. And that is the end of the movie. So I have talked a lot. So I want to hear from you guys. Uh, let's start with Michael. What do, what really stood out to you about this movie? Uh, I kept going through watching as I was watching the movie, trying to think of how to think about the movie. Because it is old. But it's also like... So I'm like, do I think about it at the time that it came out or do I think about it at the time now comparing to what's come after? Because obviously this influenced so much with, you know, everything we've seen now. But it now the stuff now, I feel like puts this to kind of like almost silliness in the sense of like, like I said, theatrical, like a, a lot of the acting, like we talked about earlier, is very overdone. It's very much like stage performers, very flim like just exaggerated and all that. Whenever like you think of something like Band of Brothers and that hits so incredibly hard, that show is so hard for me to watch. Whenever I'm sure at this the point when this came out and people having that kind of like first exposure in like a cinema fashion to what war really is and like, hey, it's not not some game. It's like just almost senseless unless, you know, depending. And, and that's such a weird thing to think about, like what you're fighting for. And is it worth it in that sense of like, you know, like like we've seen that first scene where everyone's so excited, like, oh, yeah, let's go to war. We're going to make the name of ourselves and get that honor and everything. And like just the change throughout this movie. I feel like it's mainly what this, this movie is putting out there is the just realization of how absolutely inhumane it is. And the, and yeah, like with the scenes we already talked about. So I, I, had, I had a difficult time trying to figure out how to kind of go over this movie in my head, but standing out to me definitely was Paul's arc and his, him just changing how he sees everything and how, how the world is around him. And, and that's such a hard, I've, I always find that hard in, in like war stories or war movies and books and is whenever they go back home and they don't see themselves there anymore. Like they can't, they can't re uh, what's, I can't even think of the word, but they can't reintegrate, put themselves, reintegrate. There you Thank you. Uh, put themselves back into society. And yeah. I always find that like the hardest points, like the coming back, like uh, just how do you do that? And so in the sense that he couldn't go back and he ended up just leaving early to go back to war and dies because he's just lost is very, very, very heavy. So yeah, definitely that yeah. sit on me. Well, what, what is the, I don't understand the title. All quiet on the Western front where it, it's from a after action report. It, it's kind of lost in this part because they don't show it, but yeah. basically one of the characters that gets shot at the very, very end, he's writing a report and he gets shots as like, or September something nineteen, I think seventeen, all quiet on the Western Front. Mm. That's that's what it's from. Is from an after action report. Yeah, it okay. kind of ends the novel. Got it's, you. Okay, it's kind of. I feel like they kind of made it in the the movie where it's just landing on the silence, which is another thing I also want to touch on. Is like there's basically no music in this at all whatsoever. I thought that was very very interesting. The intro I think had music when they had the credits, yeah. but the whole movie was just silent and action and dialogue. So thought that was impressive to kind of keep your attention without having to resort to that but but yeah so i think in the sense of this being where it was in this place in time i felt like it was probably you know an absolutely incredible movie now i feel like it is dated you know in that sense but still important and impactful so i'm very i'm very middling on it I'm very middle of the road on the movie of <laughs> the actual thoughts of it as a movie not as like the story you're like what the meaning is and everything behind it but but yeah so glad i watched it though Jared, I know you're not the biggest war movie guy. So what did you think about the movie? Uh, kind of the same um, thing that Michael talked about. You could see it being like the archetype for war movies and like how it like Wings. It seemed more adventurous. And this really brought out like the negatives of war and like how traumatizing it can actually be like being in those bunkers. Why it, bombs are constantly dropping and there's just the misery of like dealing with that and just like it drives people it was driving those men crazy like they had to stop their fellow men from just like leaving that bunker because they would just want to run but obviously they'd get like 
bombarded or like shot or something like that. So um, that was pretty tough to think about. Like this one, this one really sh- like made you think about the just like the, the horrors of war more than like something like Wings. And just like I think I don't watch more. Uh, I don't watch a lot of war movies like you're saying, like seeing Paul go back home. And just like how out of place he felt when he was home and how like he'd rather just go back on front lines than like kind of not, not not like be in the same headspace as these people that he's known all his life. That was pretty impactful. And just like like the my favorite scene was that classroom scene because the teacher's like, yeah, give him inspiring words. And he's like, don't die um it's, it's crap and he's like paul no what are you what are you doing and he's like i'm telling you i've been there i know what it's like and he's just like don't die and then i don't know it's just like like michael was saying like movies now they're a lot more like more of a spectacle and stuff like that but i feel like this was like an archetype of like the movies we see now and showing more sides to war and just like yeah uh, america's gonna do it and stuff like that or like this we're gonna win and stuff like that it shows the uh, downsides too all right well okay thomas uh what did you think about the movie um i really like this movie the uh this is not my favorite version my favorite version is like the 1979 version the 2022 one <laughs> no <laughs> did, anyone get a, did anyone get a chance to see that i didn't get it i didn't i did it's basically the cliff notes version and people are like oh it's so brutal i'm like well that's the only thing that they're focusing on they don't mm-hmm. really focus on like mm-hmm. a lot of the character development that this one does and the 1979 version does also it has dubstep in it so screw that movie um, also i was i was reading the ending the different endings to all the different. movies it's different yeah. it doesn't sound as good no it's not it's very <laughs> very uh not only is it streamlined but it's also very um it uses too many story tropes to to end the movie like it it just it wasn't very good ending i mean there's some decent acting in that one but anyway not talking about that new one talking about the old one old one is this one is very very good um i i went into a lot of the background of the production of this one and they actually had a lot of german veterans advise on this one the uh the uh the barbed wire scene is actually all german veterans those are and that's they actually advise the director how to do this and they're like oh no 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 no. we'll show you how and you can just film us and so they <laughs> they dug out all those trenches and like okay just go out and do it and they did it um including the uh we're talking about the hands getting blown up that's from a german veteran saying hey this is what happened this is what i saw happen and the director actually included that in there. That's not in the that's not in the the book, but an actual World War One veteran contributed to that. Um, and this is, and I, I don't really agree. A lot of movies, a lot of war movies, are like, yeah, war's great. Rah! It's like there's, to me, there's most war movies are anti-war. This movies I've seen, mm-hmm. and this one kind of started that. Wings is kind of like an adventure. I mean, it's still pretty brutal at times, yeah. but there's always a sense of this is actually getting to the public of what war is like. And this one specifically addresses the 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 toll that it takes on the soldiers fighting it and the the separation between the people at home and what it's actually like, especially when Paul goes back. Like I said, that's probably the worst scene for Paul in the entire like even like all, all everybody dying, it, Kat's death is pretty horrific. I, I or not horrific, but heartbreaking. Like oh, it's like oh, he's just sleeping. Don't worry. He's like no, no, he's dead. He's been dead for a while. So you carried this guy back for nothing, and yeah, that hits pretty hard. But it, it's some of the same things. Like he's sleeping in his own bed. He left as a kid, and he returned as not yet an adult but he's not a kid anymore and so mm-hmm. it's very weird for him to go back and even like there's there's like small things about this movie that make it just horrific 
including the, you know, when they, they get food, they're like, oh yeah, double rations. That's awesome. Double rations. Well, the reason they have double rations is because half of their troops died. Mm -hmm. So the reason they got extra food is because all these guys died. And that's the reason why they have extra food now. And just things like that. They're just like, yeah, it's like something that'll be uplifting. It's like, that's, that's pretty horrific, man. That really sucks. Um, I, I the 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 scene where with the French soldier and Paul is to me doesn't quite work in this one because a lot of it is inner dialogue inside of his mind, and so a lot of what he's saying kind of sounds I don't want to say cheesy I don't like that word but just forced like yeah oh, like Michael was saying it's kind of like the dramatic yeah. we could have been brothers stuff. we yeah. could have been friends <laughs> it's like uh, okay that doesn't really work dialogue wise. Um, but yeah, like this movie is, I, I one I think it's very important that this movie exists um, because a lot of it was. It's kind of weird too, is that World War One was one of those wars that, it it was kind of a it's stupid it's stupid that it happened because it's literally all about treaties and it kind mm -hmm. of has this this domino effect of like oh he attacks him so we attack them we attack them we attack them we attack them, and nothing had to do with any of each other. Yeah, and they even address this uh, partly. It's like I I wouldn't have fought an Englishman. This is the first time I've ever seen an Englishman. Like I don't think he's ever seen a German in his entire life. Like I have nothing against them, and so it's just it's not like World War II where there are defined yeah like reasons why they're fighting. There's no reason why these people are fighting. It's just well because you know because they told us to. <laughs> yeah, they told us to. And there's also this is the first time that war had been mechanized to a science like this where literally thousands of people were cut down in a matter of minutes. And that generally didn't happen that fast in 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 other wars. Like the, the biggest conflict they had up until this point was uh the Napoleonic War. And that was almost 100 years before that. And even then that stretched out for years and years and years. And World War II only happened within like four years. Mm -hmm. And yet this is the highest amount of casualties ever to exist ever. And on such a small, small place. And so it, it just, it's very fascinating. I think everybody should watch this if they're one, if they're history, like enthusiasts and two, if they're film enthusiasts, because this film also got a lot of flack for being made. Mm -hmm. Um, by the the censor board like that when paul okay the french women that are really really into rations <laughs> so like like oh yeah getting hot and bothered <laughs> about that bread yeah um that was really like uh scandalized like oh you couldn't you couldn't show people hand holding really and yet they implied that these women slept with them for for food mm -hmm. so uh also like the fact that they're showing germans was a big thing like oh, we don't want to see Germans. Like they're the enemy. Like why are they the enemy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, it was a very good movie. Very interesting movie. Again, Paul's actor isn't my favorite, but the character of Paul is really good. So all right, yeah. So I think out of the three we've seen so far, this is definitely the strongest movie. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah. Uh, the production was good on it and then i had the best acting i think uh out of all the three we've seen the guy who played cat was great dude yeah like, he was he was one he was hilarious like, like i love when he gets the pig it's like oh this isn't gonna feed us he's like you know what i just wish you guys would die already so i don't have to eat you food <laughs> he, so. he reminds me of uh tom sizemore in saving private yeah Ryan. he really does that that um, that sergeant character type guy. Yeah. Uh, and like Jared was saying, you can see a lot of influences this has had. Um, like Michael was saying with the whole kind of can't integrate back into society. Kind of see that like in stuff like American Sniper, um, where that's like, that's the main focus is you can't get back into um, regular life. Uh, stuff like 1917, which we reviewed, uh, which focuses on World War One. Um, so yeah, so it's a big influence. I definitely like Thomas is saying if you um, like cinema and you like history, you should definitely watch this movie. Um, oh, some of those overhead shots of like the advancing troops, those were pretty cool. Yeah, like yeah, that was sure. that's pretty impressive for 1930. 
that they got that amount of coordination out of that many guys and explosions and everything going off at the same time. Yeah, there was a lot of scenes where I was like, oh, yeah, this is California. This is <laughs> Especially like when they're in boot camp, it's like this is yeah. They always <laughs> shut. It's like the same freaking valley too. Yeah. Like, what is that about? <laughs> um, and then sometimes it did feel like it was from Amer- an American perspective, and you kind of forget that these are German guys um, a little bit. Um, but you know, it's hard. It's hard to translate kind of nationalities across uh, the board. Uh, I will give the the two thousand whatever one the two one two one this uh it is it it's it's good to see it in German because it has a bit more cultural weight behind it mm-hmm. and uh, like even over the nineteen seventy nine version that's still in in English but this yeah. one or the other one is in German so it, it kind of hits differently yeah it's especially in the classroom scene it just definitely looks like there are like American guys like American actors yeah. um. One thing I was going to say, I don't really like, like Thomas was kind of saying, I don't really like the term anti-war used for this, just because I think it's just honest. It's an honest betrayal of war. Uh, It's not really, it's not real political, like you would think. Like, if you think of anti-war, you think of kind of full metal jacket, stuff like that. Um, And this is, I... Yeah, I'm sorry. There's like another (laughs) Vietnam movie, but I mean... Vietnam's like politicized so much anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think it's just fair to call this like more of an honest betrayal of war, not not um specifically anti war, even though the book's known as an anti war book too. Um but I yeah, I think it just it, it, I think it was a bestseller just because people just wanted to know what happened. And that's kind of why Which it, is kind of interesting about like you say like anti-war move or anti-war book anti-war movie and i i I don't think that he wrote it as an anti-war movie it's just he just wanted to to let people know this is what it was like not to get any kind of thoughts about what it wasn't like yeah this is not this is not like anti-soldier at all either because it really wants you to care about the soldiers that are in this movie and not see them as um as an enemy or anything else, they just want to see you see them as people. And so, yeah, with, with, like, with flaws too. A lot of the Vietnam stuff, they kind of paint people as monsters and when they're talking about soldiers and stuff like that. And not just kind of guys that are fighting just because they're being told to fight. Yeah. Um, Especially draftees. Like that's like the worst, like, Hey, guess what? You got to go fight. I don't want to. Eh, too yeah. bad. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a uh, real good movie. Uh, I think it, it could spur a lot of good discussion, especially in this kind of day and age. Um, it's important to go back and to history and kind of watch watch movies like this. But um, I I think it's kind of interesting too about how this one and Wings were so absorbed by the public because this is like the thing that happened that everybody wanted to know about, and they have this brand new technology, you know, movies to actually portray that and and it's kind of interesting to see how that was so popular yeah um oh go ahead well because like then world war ii happened and they did the same thing is that they had this massive obsession over this event that that shaped everybody's lives and then wanted to tell stories about it so go ahead michael sorry okay you're good uh i was was just saying yeah that for that to be like what the first three of the Oscar winning movies to be war movies it just yeah. goes, goes to basically what you just said. So, yeah, real fast. I always just find this stuff kind of interesting. The budget for this movie was 1.2 million. So in today's money, that'd be about 18 million. That's not expensive. That's super cheap. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's and pretty, then I was going to just mention the turnaround from the book to this movie. Uh, it's just one year. Um, they used to oh, wow. do that a lot in early Hollywood where they just, they did dap a book like right away, <laughs> especially kinda when like, it was a bestseller. Kind of like gone with the wind. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of old books that they got turned around real fast. And I guess it, it's in a weird spot because 1930s, that's it, um, World War One 
had happened for a while. Um, but then they're, they, I guess no one knew that World War II was coming pretty soon. Well, that's what's crazy is that eight years later is when World War II started mm-hmm. from this. So that's pretty crazy that this heavily anti-nationalist movie came out. It was a huge hit. And then Germany goes right around. And it's like, you know what? Nah. <laughs> I know. You think it kind of changed people's minds into getting the war so soon, but it really didn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, so that's going to be it for this time on House 6. Uh, please subscribe, like, and uh, notify you to get more good stuff. Um, our next movie is from 1931. It's called Cimarron, so we'll take a look at that next time. So Never heard of it. See you next time. <laughs>